Uh, Mr. Melder, I would I'd just like to ask you your when you very first started your collection, you you would have had a particular intention for it. Would you would would that still be your intention, or do you have a new hope for the collection that you've compiled over the years? It hasn't changed because as uh, when I started the library I just had one book with me and as Samantha said uh, people started asking me questions and I, about Sri Lanka and I couldn't answer them all and there's no point giving half the answers before you fooling yourselves and I decided that year to get a few books from Sri Lanka and by the end of the year I had a dozen books and then I got the brainwave that why not start a library, let people come and find out for themselves. And that intention still continues 54 years later. That answered your question? Thank you. Any others? We have a wonderful opportunity. Any others? Questions? Is that collection um, catalogued and online so we could look at it? It is actually. It is right. Uh, is the collection catalogued and online? Yes, the, ca the collection is catalogued and online. Okay. And if you so. look under, go to Google, right. look for Victor Melder Street Lanka Library, and then when it opens up, click on book search. So you can search under a title, right. a given word, the author, or the date of publication. And the whole lot of them are listed there. That's it. Thank you. It was a laborious task for me sure. to do, but I eventually got it done. Right. Thank you. Um, I understand that it's also been used by a lot of people for genealogy research. Yes. Yeah. Like I said, uh, especially the burger community, I would seem to be very interested in their genealogy. And I have uh, all the rec most of the records of the Dutch Burger Union, their journals from 1903 up to the last edition, somewhere in the 1990s. So in those journals are the uh, genealogies of over 200 Burger families. And I also have the inde indexes to the baptism, marriage, and birth registers of the Wulvandal Dutch Church from 1703 up to 1958. So anybody wanting to get their certificates, the indexes are a start. And all they got to do is quote the index, the page number and the volume number. There's no search fee involved, nothing, and it's easy to get your certificates. I also have with me three volumes of the Dutch company servants. Don't forget the VOC when they were in Sri Lanka, most of their they brought their staff out and they were all listed as company servants. So I have three volumes giving their names, the date of entry into the uh, BOC and their position they occupied. Mr. Melder, uh, this uh, location in uh, Broadmeadows, where this library is, is it a private place? Can one visit it and, look, uh, and have a wander through? Yes, the, the library is in my home. Yes, I, I built a two-room. Earlier it was in my bedroom, and then it got out of hand, and I built a two-room uh, bungalow at the back of the house, so it's, uh, it's available any time I'm home, it's open. All one has to do is ring me up, make an appointment, and come over to see and you can spend your time there. As I mentioned, uh, or it is not a lending library, it's a research library. And the very idea of the library is to pay some research, not for lending. Because as you know, people are very bad in arithmetic, but very good in bookkeeping. <laughs> Mr. Mender, um, is there any possibility of, I know you are running this library on your own place. 
Is there any possibility of getting a permanent place from the government or local government? Unfortunately, I left my hearing aid at home, so Samantha is going to be there. The that is what we are all on at the moment, the future of the library. I'm getting on in years, looking down and buying it down and maybe uh, downsizing or even going to a retirement village. So I want to see the home, in the, the library in a good home. So that is what we're working at the moment. And I have a team of friends of the library led by my Mali, as I call him, Hemal Guru Singh. And he's over there. And a team of David and a few others. On that, and Jeremy Dilema, they are working on trying to find a home for this library. Once upon a time, I thought it was an easier thing. You click your finger and you find a home, but I find that it's very, very hard to find a home, a, home, a, a, a decent home for the library where it will be maintained as the, hopefully the victim of the library. But the main thing is no lending and be used for research purposes. And the main thing is be kept in Melbourne, Victoria, Melbourne, because I started it for the people in Victoria and I still want to maintain it. I've had offers from interstate, which I've turned down, as I want it to be part of the Victorian and Melbourne scene. So if you can help, you can, one of those leaflets have been handed out, you can, you know, follow the directions in that and see what you can do if you can. Thank you. very good at pulling together when needed. Um, we've often come together in times of disaster to help our, you know, people back home, but I think this is another example where I think as a community we should be pulling together to support the, the future longevity of the, of the library. So um, I hope that others will join in, in supporting this. Um, hi, Victor. Yes, I'm Al. <laughs> Mali, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Um, I'd just like to ask, I know your collection is all English books. Looking into the future, just linking it on to this uh, talk about the migration here, we do have the other communities also migrating in here. And is there ever a possibility of adding you know, non-English, as in Sinhala or Tamil, to the collection in the future? to make it more useful for whoever the migrant community. I'm only the puppet, the puppet master with now. Thank you to work. Yes, it is very possible. We find a home, a spacious home with every room. The present problem is uh, the space problems. I'm restrained by space and uh, I found out there's no proper single library in Victoria. Once upon a time, uh, Karu Liranachi used to run what was called his Port Gula. He had a collection of single books and after his demise, it just disappeared. So it is very encouraging to think that we can add single or Tamil publication and publication into that. And then it'll really become a place of research, not just selected to only the English speaking group. Thank you. I've got a question for Samanthi. Um, with your research, did you consider or not whether you explored the, the ultimate economic and social benefits of migration to Australia? By, from Sri Lanka, obviously. And even if there was a comparator with other migration from other parts of the world to here, yeah. the net economic and other benefits. Yeah. Um, I didn't for this talk because my remit was to basically look at the history of migration. But I can tell you off the, off the top of my head that um, the net benefits of migration far outweigh any economic costs um, overall of all migration to Australia. And there's lots of policy papers to, to back that up and show that. Um, I, can't, I don't have the details for the Sri Lankan community itself, but um, there is 
aggregate research that is able to, to demonstrate that. Um, so I just wanted to, um, in fact it's been kind of eye-opener for a lot of us, um, you know, the existence of, um, you know, this amazing resource. Um, do you have a plan to, um, uh, or are you already doing things to publicise this amongst perhaps um, the youth communities? Um, um, so just from my experience, in fact, um, I did my honours thesis on migration to uh, Sri Lankan migration to Australia, and I didn't know the existence of um, this um, resource pool um, as an undergraduate. Um, what is your, I mean, how do you uh, plan to get um, this out to, I guess, the, um, the undergraduates or people who are researching um, about, you know, uh, Sri Lankan ethnic identity or just um, about the history of Sri Lanka? The library has uh, not been advertised uh, Victoria-wide. It's just been a word of mouth and from one student to another student in the various universities. And that's how we had students coming and visiting uh, the library and doing research. And as I mentioned, there's no fee charge for them. The only fee that I charge is when they write their dissertation or thesis, a copy has to be lodged in the library, which will help somebody else later on. So I have about 30 or 40 such documents with me. But unfortunately, since the COVID virus started the last two years, the, the visitors have practically come to zero. Nobody has come doing any research. So that, uh, and if you did your, your research, and if you have a thesis, I'd be glad to have a copy if you're willing to share it in the library. Absolutely, it's um, currently you. at um, the sociology department at Monash University. But um, um, I think just a thought um, perhaps to, uh, you know, obviously, you know, get the word out there that it's, it's you know, there for, um, you know, similar people who, who want, want to actually, you know, read up and um, access your library, um, perhaps through social media. I think, you know, that might really encourage people to, um, you know, um, increase visitation. Um, yeah. Yeah, my fear of uh, advertising it was getting an influx of a, or a big group of people coming in and it's a small two-room bungalow. It can handle two people at a time inside and uh, can't handle crowds. Uh, about 25 years ago or 30 years ago, the uh, Mornington Grammar School uh, had a f open day in the school and each section of the school was divided into various sections and one group worked on Sri Lanka. And there came uh, about 20 students with five teachers came on a bus all the way from Mornington to the library, spent the day there. So I had to get the chairs for my neighbors, arranged it in the garden. Fortunately, it was summertime, a nice warm day. And they went in two by two and did research. And then on their way home, they stopped at Caulfield and had a, a, a lunch in a Sri Lankan restaurant. So it was very enriching to see them come and this. And then when they had their open day a week later, I was invited and I traveled by train to Frankston and they picked me up and they made their presentation. It was very, very exciting for me and to know that uh, somebody had made use of the library. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Perhaps Samanti and or and Victor. Uh, it's just occurring to me: has there not been any uh, offer of interest or expression of interest from tertiary institutions, or even the Immigration <coughs> Museum or other institutions that may be in such an area?
Yes, they said they were willing to take about 200 books. That was not my intention. Either you take the whole lot, or you don't take anything. And uh, so that is the problem. Uh, very much earlier in the piece, uh, there was an un unwritten agreement between Monash University and Dr. Vikrama Veera Surya, who was a lecturer in law at uh, Monash, who later became Sri Lankan High Commissioner in Canberra, to take over the library. But about 30 years later, when we contacted them and they said, look, there's nothing in writing, and the present situation is with my with uh, funding cuts, and looking at your catalog online, there's about 200 books we don't have, we'll only have that. What am I going to do with the rest? And the library will lose its entirety. So unfortunately, I have to turn down those offers of people who are willing to take limited amounts. So hopefully we may get this new home for the library. And as Hema said, we can also then include books in Single and Tamil and have a real proper home for the library with even a caretaker or a retired librarian administering the, the library. reflect on the state of kind of Sri Lankan studies in Australia, it's very dispersed and we don't have a concentrated group who just focus on Sri Lanka. I think if there was such a, um, such a group, for example in America they have a group called, called um, ASSELS, I think it's like the American Society for Friends of Lanka or something, but they do a lot of work around Sri Lankan studies. They have their own centre, their own library and their own scholarships. So. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything like that at the moment here. Is there another question? Yes, hi. Um, two questions, really. Uh, one is about a new home and whether with that transition, if there's an opportunity to put some of these books on uh, Google Books, so it is on accessible online as well, they're not protected by copyright laws. How would you feel about putting some of the books on Google Books um, if then, as long as they're not protected by? Well, that'll be a tedious, a tedious task. If anybody's willing to do that, well, that's a good start. Um, but uh, it'll be impossible to do all the 5,500. I think it'll be a laborious, time-consuming task. But that is an idea. Um, I was thinking when, uh, when it moves to the new place under a caretaker, maybe that's an option as well. When it moves to a new place under a caretaker, that may be an option. Yeah, yeah, that's an option to look. Um, and the second question is really, uh, what's the most fascinating thing uh, we, we've just learned as part of this collection? Did you think, what is the most fascinating thing that you've learned um, as part of this collection after reading and reviewing all this? Well, as I told Samantha the other day, she asked me, have you read all these books? I said, no, I'll have to be born about 5,000 times over to read all the books. The only time I read a book is if I get an internet query by a student then I go to the topic and then, but for me, it's a learning process and every day I learn something new on Sri Lanka. There's so much that we can never ever know or learn on Sri Lanka, but it's got the 2005 year, 500 year history and there's so much happened and all that time and it's a fascinating place. I'll give you one bit of information. I grew up in the village of Elugoda in Peradeniya on the Daulagala road from, from Panidenia to Daulagala. Now when you take that road from Panidenia to Daulagala, you can cut across and join the Candy Kalamu road at a place called Kiribat Kumbura. So between Daulagala and Kiribat Kumbura, there is a little village there called Kiriwaula. Kiriwaula. Now that has been coming down the villages there, there's about 15 families over 200, year, 200 years, coming from generation to generation. They mine a, a quartz there, different quartz, and they keep polishing it, polishing it, polishing it. It takes about a year just polishing it. They had primitive instruments, just little play, we quite open on the polish and polish, and they make a pair of blades for your glasses. Now, once you get those glasses, you never ever have to change a lens again. If your sight improves, the lens adjusts. If your sight deteriorates, the lens adjusts. Very, very few people know about that. That's a bit I knew because I, I witnessed that. How much like that there is that we don't know. And not much of it is documented either. So there's so much to know. 
about Sri Lanka. So remember Kiri Waula, where they make the quartz, the lenses. Probably you know things that I don't know, to other things too, like you read. And fortunately for me, before I migrated, I was a driver on the railway, I was a train driver. And was a, I have traveled the length and breadth of Sri Lanka. So I've traveled everywhere. And uh, I've seen a lot of places and know much. That sort of endeared it more to me. Which year was that? I cannot tell you that off the top of my head, but they are a significant part of um, the, the connections between the two countries. There are also the pearl divers in the Torres Strait as well, and that, they were the divers that I referred to. Victor might know. Do you know when the pearl divers came to Brooms? Yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if you go to Broome and visit the Broome Museum, Three quarter of the Broom Museum is called the TB Ellis section. TB Ellis, E L I E S. Now he was earlier Elias Apuhami from from the Gaul area, yeah. and his name was anglicised to TB Ellis. At present, I think his great great grandson is the dentist at Broom. Now, if you go, as I said, if you visit the Broom Museum. Now, Elise was a man who was very adept at uh, pearling. I'm told that he was able to skin a pearl with his two fingers, like a skinner, a shallot or a red onion, he was able to skin it. So in the museum, you find his old, uh, his telephone, the scales that he weighed the pearls, some pearls, and a lot of his artifacts. So he contributed a lot to the pearling industry in Australia. Just, sorry, one more thing. I forgot to tell uh, Shamri when she visited my library. In uh, the first migrant, or rather, we can't call him a migrant, he was sent from Sri Lanka. Uh, Australia was a penal colony settlement. And a lot of them came from England and Ireland. But when the um, British attacked the Candian Kingdom, they had a, a Malay regiment. That was part of the British group that attacked the Candian Kingdom. And Major, Major Davy led the group. And there was very, very intense fighting. And a large number of them were wiped out. And uh, Major Davy was taken, was killed. And a number were taken captive. And, but some of the members of the Malay Regiment then defected. They turned, went over to the Candian Kingdom. And finally, when the British Got, got the Candian Kingdom, they went looking for those people and they were court martial and they were, most of them were put to death. But there was one fellow by the name of Elise, Dean, he was, sorry, sorry, he was Dean. I forget his first name, Dean, but I have the, the, the paper with me. Uh, they found out that he knew a lot about Major Davy, a lot of information they were wanted and it would be a shame to put him to death. So what they decided was to exile him to the penal settlement of Australia. So he was the first one that came from Ceylon in 1802. He came on the SS Kangaroo, a ship called the SS Kangaroo. He came with his wife and he had three children and they came over and came to Sydney. And he was working there on the docks, he was given him the job. But he became a very uh, conscientious worker, a good worker, and he ended up becoming an auxiliary policeman in, in, in uh, New South Wales. And uh, the interesting thing was his great granddaughter, and he of course intermarried, and he had three more children here, so he had six children, and uh, his great granddaughter uh, was very uh, concerned that she had jet black hair. She was very fair, jet black hair, and she always asked her mother and grandmother, how is it, she knew that there was something not right, and she asked, how is it that I, we ha I have black hair? She said, oh, we are all Welsh, and the Welsh people have got black hair. But she said she 
didn't accept that. And she went to the uh, State Library in Sydney and she started with research going back to the old newspapers which I had. And then she found out the history of D. So he was the first one that came from Sri Lanka rather, not as an immigrant, but sent as a, to the penal colony of Australia. That is so fascinating and doesn't it change our view of Australian history as well? It's not just about our, our ancestry, it's also the view of Australian history. So that's, I, I had no idea about that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much.